So I know many of you have been asking me to begin a series where we look at individual figures within the 40k verse, especially to look at figures like the Primarchs, as these are obviously some of the most well-known and legendary figures within the history and lore of 40k. However, in starting this I wasn't sure if I wanted to begin with some sense of order and continue with a set structure to the figures. And I asked you guys on the community section and the general consensus was to do the order of individuals however I felt and whatever I felt was interesting at the time. And this I think makes the most sense and then I'll later order the figures into some kind of playlist structure that makes sense. I already have several interesting characters lined up, obviously Eisenhorn is coming very soon. Today though, I thought rather than go for something obvious, we would start with a man and a group whose name would surely inspire terror into the enemies of the Imperium. That man is Colonel Bane of the Mordant Acid Dogs. The Imperial Guard Regiment known as the Mordant Acid Dogs hails unsurprisingly from the world of Mordant, and the planet itself is classed as a night world, and these are gloomy places where the sun rarely, if ever, shines. The surface of Mordant is consequently an inhospitable and barren place not fit for any ordinary human habitation. The sole reason humans are stationed on the planet is that it is also designated as an imperial mining world, and here the humans that live below the surface work to extract not minerals as you might more commonly expect, but instead they seek out a bioluminescent bacteria which secrete acid that breaks down the rock into a digestible form, and these bacteria are then processed to create various highly corrosive acids used by primarily the forge worlds of the Imperium. The bacteria have over millennia created through this process of slowly dissolving the rock a vast network of caverns all across the planet. And the mining operations themselves are not as well organised as you might perhaps imagine. The miners that operate here are more like clans or guilds and fiercely territorial about their claims. The miners though are not the only inhabitants of Morden. Over millennia as overspill from initial miners and the families that were sent here, the caverns of Morden also house a large population of disillusioned worker class who live in what are little more than vast slums. Because of the limited work controlled by the mining clans, many citizens end up in a life of crime and the underworld of Morden is not entirely dissimilar to the underhive worlds of many Imperial Hive cities. Dark, dangerous, and every other person is ready to kill you just for your boots. In fact, the gangs that control many areas on Mordant are by many citizens the only true authority that they'll pay any attention to. So with all that in mind, it's a fairly obvious conclusion that the Imperial Guard troops drawn from the populace of Mordant are usually fairly disillusioned with life on their world, as well as being tempered by some of the worst conditions for many an Imperial citizen to grow up in. But as depressing as life on Mordant is, many who sign up for the regiment are looking to to aspire to something greater and more noble, something more aspirational. The mining clans will pay them barely enough to scrape together scraps of food, and the gangs are immoral animals for the most part. So the regiment for many seems the preferable option, even if the conditions they end up fighting within is far from anything one would wish for. But the same could surely be said for almost any Imperial Guard regiment, one way or the other. The Mordant fighters consequently make some of the best underground tunnel or hazardous environment fighters that exist in the Imperium. Because the majority of the regiment are made up of those who had to scavenge and survive in extremely harsh conditions for most if not all of their lives, as well as fighting off criminals and undesirables on a daily basis, the fighters of Mordant are in some respects not unlike a hive gang themselves, extremely adaptable and ready to use almost anything that lies to hand if it will help in their immediate situation. And compared to some other regiments, they are among the most malleable and well versed in using not only their own war gear and specialist equipment, but that of other regiments as well. Many Mordant Guardsmen will carry a few specialist pieces of kit for themselves like eye protection to allow them to cope with a variety of spectrums of light and this is due to their life in extremely low light conditions. Anything other than dull gloom can be blinding to them, however they make the very best use of low light visors to allow them to see in pitch black what we would see as almost daylight. Now Colonel Bane was a soldier who had spent significant time first in the Mordant Planetary Defence Force fighting against the many gangs and syndicates who in reality operated more like small scale private armies within the vast deep caverns below the surface of Morden, and the PDF's role was in combating and performing strikes against these criminal forces to attempt to best quell any major uprisings 
or expansive spread of territory that could threaten the mining operations and the supply of chemicals to the Imperium. Any such move, of course, would have been vastly short-sighted on the part of the criminal groups who would only be subjected to increasingly severe actions if they became a genuine problem in the supply of essential materials for fabrication on Forge Worlds. Both the Mordant Regiment and the PDF also regularly deal with horrific human mutants and their collectives, who form over many years as a result of the highly toxic conditions on Mordant, and this leads many Mordant to harbour particularly severe disdain for any human mutants, and they're often used to eradicate this genetic blight wherever it is found in the Imperium, because they will pursue it with almost zealous fanaticism. Bane was by now already highly experienced and had been detached as part of an assault group used to eliminate a mutant uprising and then to destroy its leadership. And this came from near to the Cadian Gate of the Eye of Terror, a situated collective of some 30 planets known as the Gloom Worlds. And these worlds were surrounded by a dense cloud of particulate, both physical and psychic in nature, and was believed to have originated from the creation of the Eye of Terror. But one could only speculate as to what this material actually consisted of, perhaps a destroyed Eldar homeworld or even a craft world. But either way, it was this material that was commonly believed to lead to a far higher than average rate of abhuman and mutants on the gloom worlds. Abhumans are not regarded by humanity the same way that mutants are. For example, abhumans would be smaller humanoids known as ratlings or the enlarged hulks known as ogrins. And while these forms are more generally accepted, those on the gloom worlds were seen to carry further mutations such as eyes that were entirely blackened, making individuals terrifying to look upon. Black eyes, like a doll's eyes. Others would have tiny mouth holes or even leech-like sucking mouths with inverted teeth, as well as often seeing discoloured flesh or thickened veins prominent below the surface of their skin. And these worlds, which for most of humanity would not exactly be coveted territory, were desired by a chaos lord known as Jihar the Lacerator. Formerly of the Emperor's Children Legion, he drew to him not only Chaos Space Marines, but also vast hordes of cultists and mutants. In the year of 599 of M37, Jihar would launch a Black Crusade upon the Gloom Worlds, and because of their experience with the twilight and now mutant-infested conditions of the planet, the mortant acid dogs, including Colonel Bane, would be deployed to destroy Jihar, whose status had been growing with the Prince of Pleasures since the end of the heresy. And by the time he launched his somewhat small in the grand perspective assault on the Gloom Worlds, it had been said that Slanesh had granted him such horrific powers that even the dead themselves would scream as he drew near to them. And this may well be a reference to the suffering eternal souls of the Eldar more than that of humans. Colonel Bane would be deployed during Stage 2 of the Imperial Counter Operations as commander of the 13th Mordant Acid Dogs, tasked with scouring a plague of mutants from Hyric 5. They would deploy to the outskirts of a slum city known as Gravesville, before boarding transports that would take them to their objective of encircling and then clearing the city of the mutant genetic crimes against humanity five regiments would participate. Under the strict and well-ordered leadership of Bane, the 13th would progress steadily, using guard artillery to rain down precise devastation on any area they took sporadic sniper fire or positions that appeared too heavily reinforced. As they approached the centre of the slum city, they discovered more and more mutilated members of the Hyric PDF, and they had seemingly been strung up for display. Upon their bodies were carved dark and abhorrent runes that some of the Mordant made the mistake of looking at with their own eyes, causing them somehow to collapse to their knees, vomiting and clutching their bodies in agonising pain. Bane knew that this was not a simple uprising of genetic rejects. These realisations led Bane to forge immediate plans to expand their operation and press forward with momentum beyond the city. He did so understanding that their immediate priority must be to locate the centre of this nest of depravity and heresy. While his forces continued, he dispatched scouts outside the city to look for signs of this stronghold of control. The landscape around the city was difficult and hazardous. Hyric 5 had endured pollution and waste for millennia, and by now it covered the surface of much of the region they were now forced to find a path through. Toxic materials, mountains of rotting waste and dangerous industrial scrap made progress slow, and while their heavier tanks and machines could move relatively easily, they still encountered unstable ground or pieces of scrap that had to be removed for progress to be able to continue. Their searching gulag into the wasteland continued for many days. Eventually, they would discover their foes, who had strangely crafted a base from one of the larger mountains of scrap and waste materials. Bane would join his forward scouts in assessing this discovery. 
It was crude and pathetic to look at, to be sure, but Colonel Bain could see it was also deceptively well set, with fortifications, varying tiers of bunkers and firing positions. Hidden among the detritus and scrap were many hundreds of meters of wire, and given this level of preparation, Bain already anticipated hidden traps, mines, and improvised explosives. This only reinforced his previous assessment that they were facing more than a ramshackle group of crazed mutants. They also observed how in one area some sort of statue had been forged from rusting metal and its symbols bore resemblance to the sigils they had seen carved into the bodies of the Hyrick PDF back in the slum city. Few of his troopers understood the significance of this, but Colonel Bain knew well that his troops would be facing a weapon they could not counter with lasguns and grenades. He gave the order to assign from their small contingent of ecclesiarchy preachers one to each platoon, and he hoped that this would be enough to safeguard their minds and souls from what they would have to face. But Bain knew his men were well trained and they had the initiative and the willpower to overcome what they faced, but in truth he didn't know if all of this would be enough. Many of them suffered a nightmare riddled sleep before the dawn and the start of their battle. As morning came, some members of the 13th had already been at work infiltrating the outer fortifications to disable and clear pathways in for the main force, which would be split and designated into companies. With their experience and training, as well as the specialist equipment that they had been designated, they were able to move quickly through much of the fortifications, even under fire. They were able to detect, disarm or destroy the mines and traps that blocked their way. Despite their fast, early progress, the assault slowed to a crawl as they became caught up in heavier and often more close quarter fighting. C Company was taking the worst of it as they attempted to overcome their defences guarding a command bunker atop one of the mountains of waste materials. As hard as they fought and using all their initiative, the enemy continued to keep them pinned and tied in brutal close quarter fighting. The ground all around them was by now a mixture of polluted waste, sickly crimson and often a mixture of rusting scrap metal and torn flesh and sinew. Things were not progressing in their favour, and if left unchecked, they were risking being pushed back or even the potential for the line to be broken, and Bane could not entertain such possibilities. Running his troops with ferocious war cries that these abominations would not break the guard of the Imperium and the Emperor, and that no stinking rabble of mutants would drag the acid dogs back down into the filth today, he led a counter-assault of three companies. The weight, rage and ferocity of their assault would immediately stabilise and catch the mutant defenders off guard, who had not been anticipating such a zealous punch to the gut and had been far too complacent in their small gains. Yet this did not deter the mutant wretches. The mordant fighters saw how their foes bore equally burning hatred for humankind. Many would leap into the fire, screaming from their fleshy, distorted mouth holes. They were fearless and unrelenting. The scene became a true battle of screaming attrition. Two forces both white hot with hate for the other, wrestling each other to the ground in a pit of blood and acidic stinking waste. It was late in the day when one company of the Mordant would gain a small foothold into breaching the command bunker. Bane and his immediate troops would lead an assault determined to smash and break these foes of mankind and end the horror, for this day at least. As they breached the bunker, it quickly became awash with the blood of the abominations as the preacher swung his heavy twin-bladed eviscerator chainsword, decapitating the mutant leader in a shower of black, sickly fluids. They had won the day, but turning around to absorb the spectacle as they stood atop the mountain of scrap, they could see that little remained of the Mordant Sea Company. Many others had taken severe losses, and it was a depressing sight, but they were victorious. Many survivors were also seen to be suffering what appeared to be extreme combat stress reactions, or so they thought. Bane knew better and ordered them now to retreat as they set explosives to destroy the enemy command position. The scrap-filled ashen wastes were now a mass grave for far too many Morden guardsmen. Unfortunately though, the real scars from the battle were far worse than the physical and the superficial. It wasn't until over a week later when many Mordant guardsmen who had survived the assault began to display disturbing signs of mental corruption. Caught in their eyes was a disturbingly distant gaze. Heretical tattoos began to appear and some would even partake in group bloodletting. There would even be an increase in psychic fields around the guard as an aside, 
This is further evidence that ordinary non-psychic humans exhibit a latent psychic potential, another reason why the Dark Gods demonstrate an especial interest in mankind. It seemed that officers like Bane were right in their suspicion that the strange sigils and constructions around the mutant camp harboured darker forces, yet the slight transformation in the behaviour of their troops had gone largely unnoticed. It was only covert inquisitional agents who had infiltrated the Mordant, as they often do with Imperial Guard regiments to assess for any potential corruption before it becomes too severe of a problem, and they hoped that the engagements would promptly continue and that the ordinary casualty rate among the Imperial Guard engagements would naturally eliminate these contaminated troopers before the situation grew serious enough to warrant more openly corrective actions. It was also noted that it was indeed difficult to assess how many, if any, of the more senior officers and commissars had been also affected by their recent encounters, including Colonel Bain. But instead of immediately continuing on, it would in fact be several weeks before the Mordant took up arms again. During this time, Colonel Bain had now become all too aware of the combat stress being exhibited by the men and women of the 13th Mordant. Bane had attempted to quell the sweeping levels of insubordination, fighting in the ranks and other disturbing behaviour by increasing Imperial Ecclesiarchy services held by the Preachers, but it had little impact and soon the officers were considering executions to try and restore order to the 13th. More concerning was the three-stage counter-offensive by the Imperium across the assaulted gloom worlds was proceeding poorly, and Bane was receiving reports that on many worlds retreats had been made, yet as fate would have it, the very next day, Bane and many in the 13th awoke to alert sirens and garbled reports of a deploying assault in progress. Fire trails across the sky were immediately identified as being Astartes drop pods, and there could be no doubt that Jihar was now on Hyrek 5. Colonel Bain quickly gathered his officers, who were quick to begin forging their various tactics. Sergeants were screaming and tipping guardsmen out of their beds to ready the Mordant for action, albeit with slightly less urgency and allowing far more backtalk than perhaps they would have tolerated on any other day. Bain could see from the trajectory of descent by the drop pods that they were likely landing near to where the Cadian 17th were stationed. They quickly made attempts to reach them on the Vox but all that could be heard across the open communication channel were blood-curdling screams, begging, sobbing cries for mercy, and the sound of flesh being whipped, torn, and lacerated. With his eyes narrowing bitterly, Bane had no intention whatsoever of allowing such pitiful, crying pleas to become the historical fate of the 13th. Eventually, one of the few remaining 17th Cadian guardsmen, who apparently still had his sanity intact, came across the Vox, distorted, panicked and screaming for an artillery strike on their position immediately, but he was soon cut off mid-sentence until all that could be heard was incoherent screaming followed by silence and the heavy, artificially rasped breathing of an Astarte suit, but one that clearly sounded distorted, damaged, unholy, and then silence. Bane ordered the artillery strike immediately saying a prayer silently as he watched the bombardment far in the distance, clouds rose from the former 17th camp. He hoped that any survivors would be saved from further horrors. Bane received word from overall command what they had already concluded themselves, that the Chaos Marine commander was now on Hyrek 5. Guardsmen facing Chaos Space Marines notwithstanding, they were also still suffering from a less than 100% combat effective force whose morale was on a knife edge and now they had to face off against an enemy that had by all accounts turned entire populations into mindless slaves spouting gibberish and no doubt committing any number of inhuman acts to themselves and others. Many guardsmen already thought they heard voices on the winds encouraging them to give up, to run away or to turn on their brothers in arms. But they did not turn back. They pressed forward into the wastelands once again, and here Bane and his 13th found themselves on a plane of existence they could never have nor would have ever wanted to imagine. Entities from beyond the physical realm, horrors and temptations surrounded them. The sights and sounds that consumed many can barely be envisaged as their very minds and souls were stolen willingly or violently. Except somehow, many of the 13th stood together. They stood strong, and Colonel Bane led his men and women steadily forward, all clinging to their ideals, that they were the mordant acid dogs. They came from a world where every moment of every day was spent 
in temptation of dark forces and dark individuals trying to drag you down, to tear your spirit and soul away from the light, to commit acts of self-degradation, of blasphemy, of heresy. But they knew there was a greater purpose for mankind, and they knew that they aspired to rise above the scum of the earth, the abominations, the weak and the pitiful. They lay down continual and heavy fire against their enemy, and the dead wood of the mordant had now been cut away, and all that remained in the 13th was the core, and they were strong and unmovable. Their fire cut through the strange beasts and entities that had poured forth from the Immaterium, and who can say if it was their weapons that caused this, or simply their sheer burning hatred for the Xenos, for the non-human, for the unspeakable horrors. But their most powerful weapon was their strength of faith in the Emperor of Man. Finally, they could see their ultimate foe. Bane himself came raging down like a man possessed, a force of the Emperor. One could have easily mistaken his fearless rampage into the heart of battle for that of an Astartes. Yet the confrontation from there on remains a mystery. Those who witnessed the final screaming assault into the heart of darkness by the 13th were spotters who were some significant distance away, but it's said that in the midst of the battle that ensued, the very skies themselves were torn apart by lightning and fire, the likes of which had not been seen by the human guardsmen observing. Often ethereal energy would lash around the battle site, and these bright flashes and screams that cut through the minds of the observers, some so bright that they electrified the air, and even artillery operators miles away were forced to turn away from the light. Despite all of this, after the dust had settled, the light and fire extinguished, the 13th, it seems, were victorious. It wouldn't be until the next day when a bedraggled column of staggering, exhausted, blackened and often badly injured 13th mordant men and women came back toward the Imperial lines. Jihar the Lacerator was dead. How such a feat had been achieved by the guard of the mordant is not known and so, similarly, is the fate of Colonel Bane. It seems that the 13th Mordant Acid Dogs and Colonel Bane had somehow through their aspirations from their dark and depressing homeworld tapped into a power they never imagined they had within themselves. Their absolute resolve to rise above the misery and abhorrent immorality of the slums of Mordant brought forth their greatest power when they needed it the most. Such feats are not entirely unknown to occur within the Imperium. Often this has led to ordinary humans being designated as blessed or even as saints by the Ecclesiarchy, for they are the few who have exhibited not only the absolute purity of spirit and most powerfully focused resolve, but they also demonstrate that they have somehow been touched by the Emperor himself, selected for divinity and greatness. For the ordinary guardsmen and women, along with Colonel Bane leading them to have overcome a champion Chaos Marine and his surrounding followers as well as the warp horrors from the Immaterium leaves us in no doubt that in their final battle they exhibited a strength of will that by ordinary human standards would lead at least any Astartes and perhaps even any Grey Knight to give due respect to. In the millennia that follows, the tale of Colonel Bane and the 13th is still taught to many new recruits in the Imperial Guard that any of them who find themselves facing an enemy beyond imagination or wielding a power that defies all rational thought, where no existing combat strategy seems appropriate or where no tactic could lead to victory, they will learn by example that the only weapon a Guardsman needs to fight such horrors is the unquestioning faith in the Emperor of Man himself. Any guardsman who would hope to prevail against the odds should reach deep within themselves and find that beacon of light, that white-hot spirit that is an anathema to the darkness. The only possible way to emerge victorious when facing such foes is to allow oneself to be consumed by the devotion for the Emperor and, of course, to die in his name. For indeed, any enemy who should face a warrior of mankind wielding such powers, what possible defence could they employ?